In psychology, there is what is called escape mechanisms. Now all of us, we use these techniques to some extent to shield ourselves from momentary uh, lapses of where we have this period of, of uh, over anxiety. Now these mechanisms are rationalization, suppression, repression, denial, and overreacting in opposite directions and so forth. Now one method of escape in particular is called logic type compartmentation. This is when a person behaves as if they have two compartments in their minds, each with its own set of values, possibly in direct conflict with one another. Some, it is necessary as they desire to live by two different mindsets. For example, one might say that he believes in democracy and equal rights but also believes in racial segregation. Another thinks religion and business should not mix. Now he is honest and sincere as far as he is concerned in his religious conviction on Sunday, but he is unscrupulous in his business dealings throughout the week. And it needs to be remembered that such a person is basically unaware of these inconsistencies in his attitudes and actions. This seems to describe the thinking of the Old Testament third king of Israel, Solomon. He had a similar problem. It almost seems as if there were two separate sections in Solomon's mind. One was very wise and was reserved for giving excellent advice to his subjects. The other was extremely foolish and was used in making very illogical personal choices for self. He was like a modern day Dr. Jekyll Good and Mr. Hyde Bad. He's the individual that Paul is talking about in Romans chapter 7, the one who has two personalities. Solomon's life is essentially one of sharp contrast. He had a glorious beginning. His parents, David and Bathsheba, lost a previous child because of sin, but they acclaimed his birth with great thanksgiving. David named him Solomon, or the peaceful one, expressing a desire for a tranquil reign for him. But God gave him even a loftier name, Jedidiah, which literally means darling of the Lord. Well, he ascends to the throne after the death of his father when he was just a little less than 18 years of age. He was one of the purest and the most promising use that the human mind can imagine, wholesome in all of his ways. However, when we look ahead 40 years and we see him, still less than age 60, he is self-indulged in body and troubled by an empire about to fall. So let us now notice the lessons that can be found in Solomon's life. Now as we go through the early chapters of 1 Kings, we will notice several evidence of Solomon's tremendous wisdom. First, he was wise in his early choices. One of his first acts as king was to visit the high place of Gibeon, where the temple still stood. There he offered 1,000 burnt offerings upon the altar of Moses. While at Gibeon, God appears to him in a dream at night. And the Lord said, ask what you wish me to give you. 1 Kings 3, verse 5. Now, if you were given such a choice, what would you select? A long life? Riches? Honor? Solomon chose wisdom. In 1 Kings 3, verse 7 to 9. Now, O Lord my God, 
Thou has made thy servant king in place of my father David. Yet I am but a little child. I do not know how to go out and come in. And thy servant is in the midst of thy people, who, which thou hast chosen, a great people, who cannot be numbered or counted for multitude. So give thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people to discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge the great people of thine? Young people, please hear this. Your goals will largely determine what you are and what you become in life. Try to obtain what is truly important. Christian character, honesty, and a good name, rather than earthly desires. Because Solomon chose the blessing of wisdom, he received many other blessings from God too. 1 Kings 3, verse 10 to 14. Many years ago, in sort of the early, early 1830s, around 1835 or so, when Princess Victoria became Queen of England, Lord Marlborough opened the Bible and read to this young monarch the story of Solomon's decision for wisdom. Wouldn't it be wonderful if every public official in our government would have a dream like Solomon's and then make an intellectual, intelligent decision for wisdom? Second, Solomon was wise in his dealings with others. The scriptures give us one illustration of Solomon's wisdom, and it's an incident that occurred shortly after this dream that he had from God. Two harlots were claiming the same infant as one mother's child had died. Solomon decides that he's going to divide this living child in two and give each mother a half. Well, the true mother, upset, says, give the child to the other woman. And this other woman, she replies, dividing. Well, Solomon's insight identifies the right woman or mother. Now, as a result of this decision, verse 28, when all Israel heard of the judgment which the king had handed down, they feared the king. For they saw that the wisdom of God was in him to administer justice. Now there is an uninspired tradition about his wisdom with the Queen of Sheba. Supposedly, she brought two banquet or two bouquets of flowers to the king. One was real and the other was artificial. Yet the craftsmen commissioned by her had made them so lifelike that it was impossible to tell the difference. So she challenged Solomon to choose the real flowers. Well, after a moment or two puzzling over the matter, he ordered that the palace window be opened as he saw bees swarming outside. The insects flew directly to the live flowers, demonstrating Solomon's ingenuity. Accordingly to the legend, Queen of Sheba was greatly impressed by Solomon's wisdom. Now chapter 10 of 1 Kings does record her meeting with Solomon. Then she said to the king, it was a true report which I heard in my own land about your words and your wisdom. Nevertheless, I did not believe the reports until I came and my eyes had seen it. And behold, the half was not told me. You exceed in wisdom and prosperity the report which I received. That's verse 6 and verse 7. Third, Solomon was wise in his education of others. He was the father of what is called the wisdom literature. We are told in 1 Kings 4, verse 31 and 32. For he was wiser than all men, and his fame was known in all the surrounding nations. He also spoke 3,000 proverbs, and his psalms were 1,005. Now, of his proverbs, only about one-third have been preserved today. And his psalms are, well, less known, as we only do have a sample of one here, Psalms 127. 
So in addition, though, to the Proverbs and his Psalms, he did write Ecclesiastes as well as the Song of Solomon. Number four, he was wise in his glorification of God. Solomon will always be known for building the great temple of God in which God's name was glorified. It has been said it was a dream of his father, but he was not allowed to erect God's house because he had been a man of bloodshed. This tremendous task fell to Solomon, and it was an amazing effort. 30,000 Israelites and 153,600 aliens in the land were pressed into service. An untold amount of precious stones and uh, uh, gems and metals went into this project. Perhaps the most unique characteristic of the building project is seen in 1 Kings 6, verse 7. And the house, while it was being built, was built of stone prepared at the quarry, and there was neither hammer nor axe nor any iron to heard in the house while it was being built. So it was, all these pieces were brought to Jerusalem and they were assembled like Legos. Finally, after seven and a half years, the temple was ready. The ceremonial dedication is recorded in 1 Kings 9. Solomon gave a speech to the children of Israel on this grandest occasion, and the glory of God filled the temple. Here was the climax of Solomon's career. At this pinnacle, however, we also see an indication of that to come. Again, God appeared to Solomon in 1 Kings 9, verse 3 to 9, and in effect, God was telling Solomon and the people, if you turn away, the fall will be great and spectacular as the rise. It must be said that Solomon was very wise in those matters where he obeyed God. As a result, his glory is spread, as already noticed, through the Jewish people, other nations, and the queen. Of Sheba. The Scottish writer Alexander Wythe, this is what he said about this. If ever any young saint sought first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and had all these things added to him, it was Solomon. If ever there was anyone of whom it could be said that he attained and was already perfect, it was Solomon. If ever there was anyone uh, or if ever, if ever a blazing lighthouse was set up on the sea of life to warn every man and to teach every man, it was Solomon. If ever it was said over any child's birth, where sin abound, grace did abound more, it was surely over the birth and the birthright and graces of Solomon. His wisdom was seen in le uh, leadership, in finances, in communication, in relationship with monarchs, as well as wisdom in planning. However, after this glorious start, one would be tempted to pass over the closing years of Solomon's career in silence as he is the most foolish man. In fact, 1 Chronicles and 2 Chronicles do just that. There's no mention of his later years. But God has a lesson for us here. In the early life of Solomon, if it's illustrated in Matthew 6, verse 33, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, then his later life is an example of 1 Corinthians 10, verse 12. Let him who thinks he stand take heed, lest he falls. In contrast to Solomon's immense wisdom, we must also know his vast foolishness. In 1 Kings chapter 11, we find the final chapter of Solomon's life. Previously, the text had emphasized the king's fame. Here, the focus shifts to his shame. We need to know that Solomon did not reach this sad condition overnight. 
David Payne in what's called the International uh, Standard Bible Encyclopedia. This is what he wrote. Solomon's exhibited great ability in a variety of fields as a politician, diplomat, strategist, organizer, and administer, administrator, he excelled. His undoing was his lack of moderation, his extravagance in, heart, in, in his har harem, court luxury, and building schemes laid an impossible burden on his subjects. Solomon brought his empire to the brink of disruption. To put it bluntly, King Solomon was out of control. He can be compared to an individual who is speeding down the highway with a full tank of gas, but he has a busted steering wheel and no brakes. As we examine Solomon's last days, we should be reminded that someday we likewise will be writing the closing chapter of our lives. Therefore, it is never too soon to ask, how will my final chapter read? First, Solomon was foolish in marriage. In the law of Moses, God set forth specific prohibitions for Israel's kings, including neither shall he multiply wives for himself, lest his heart be turned away. Deuteronomy 17, 17. It was common for ancient rulers to have large harems. Having many wives was seen as a sign of wealth and importance. However, Israel's king was God's representative. As such, he was to be different from the worldly kings around him. 1 Kings 11, starting at verse 1. Now King Solomon loved many foreign women, along with the daughter of Pharaoh. Solomon held fast to these in love, and he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines. And his wives turned his heart away. Now how did this wise man get into such a situation? Solomon did whatever was politically expedient. Marrying Pharaoh's daughter, Solomon pledged self to Egypt. As well as marrying other princesses, he was making alliances with the most wealthy and powerful people around him, even from his neighboring pagan countries. Now, a concubine wasn't just a mistress. She was more than that. She was like a second-class wife. These women were probably chosen for their physical sexual attraction and not their cooking abilities or political connections. Marrying these foreign women was a bad example because as the king's actions encouraged other fellow Jews to do the same. However, the worst was still to come. The most tragic aspect of Solomon's transgression is found in 1 Kings 11, verse 4. For it came about, when Solomon was old, his wives turned his heart away after other gods, and his heart was not wholly devoted to the Lord his God. In verse 5 to 7, same chapter, Solomon built detestable idols to all these heathen gods, on the high places as well as on the mountain east of Jerusalem. Verse 8. Thus also he did for all of his foreign wives who burned incense and sacrificed to their gods. As the leader of the Israelite nation, King Solomon had put his seal of approval on the worship of false gods and soon his subjects began to worship them in 1 Kings 11, verse 33. Centuries later, Nehemiah would use Solomon as a cautionary example. When the Jews in his day were intermarrying the non-Jew, the prophet told them, Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin regarding these things? Yet among the many nations, there was no king like him, and he was loved by his God, and God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, the foreign women caused even him 
to sin. Chapter 13, verse 26. Now, how did Solomon ever reach this low point in his spiritual life? I want you to notice how often the word heart is found in 1 Kings chapter 11. Verse 2. They will surely turn your heart away after their gods. Verse 3. His wives turned his heart away. Verse 4. His wives turned his heart away after other gods and his heart was not totally or uh, devoted to the Lord his God as the heart of David his father had been. Verse 9. The Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart had or was turned. Brethren, the spiritual battleground will always be the human heart. Even Solomon wrote, watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flows the springs of life. Proverbs 4, verse 23. The problem was that Solomon loved his wives more than he loved his God. Now there's two lessons for us that are obvious. One, be careful whom you marry. And number two, take care that you do not allow your spouse to lead you away from God. In other words, let no one or no thing come between you and your God. Secondly, Solomon was foolish in compromise. Near to God's temple, Solomon erected heathen altars. Under this wise king, idolatry that his father David had been so zealous to suppress was established alongside the dwelling place of the true and living God. You know, I have heard the statement compromise is the secret to success. However, some compromise made by worldly wise folks is the epitome of foolishness. Consider or foolishness. Consider Christian business persons who do not drink themselves, but nevertheless will host cocktail parties. They even send gifts of liquor to their customers and or employees. Number three. Solomon was foolish in selfishness. He put himself above God. He spent 13 years building his palace. If the investment of our time is an indicator of our priorities, what can be said of Solomon, who spent seven and a half years constructing a glorious temple for God, but nearly twice that amount of time erecting a magnificent structure for self. Perhaps this little proverb, not written by Solomon, but it does say it best. A man wrapped up in himself makes a very small package. Number four, Solomon was foolish in seeking pleasure and possession. Solomon multiplied horses and stables and wealth as prophesied in Deuteronomy 17, verse 16 and 17 about the future kings of Israel. He literally sought happiness in wine, women, and song, but he could not find it. Eventually, he became disillusioned. He came to realize that great possessions and the search for happiness in pleasure are vanity. All is vanity, Solomon will declare in Ecclesiastes 1, verse 2. Seemingly, Solomon had it all, but with danger. Jesus would later say, it is wiser, or it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Mark 10, verse 25. Too many good things ruin too many people. After gaining so much, Solomon left it all. There is no real security can be found in wealth. While Solomon amassed all that he had, he was harassed by adversaries that came and looted much of it. 1 Kings 11, verse 14 to 26. Like two outsiders, 
Hadad the Edomite, and Rizan the Syrian, as well as an insider named Jeroboam of Ephraim. Basically, Solomon was foolish in disobeying God. His disobedience hurt him and his country deeply. Someone wrote of Solomon that he died worn out by excessive self-indulgence, leaving behind him an impoverished tre treasury, a discontented people, and a tottering empire. Actually, what God had warned Solomon about, Solomon about had indeed come to pass. God allowed the kingdom to be taken away from Solomon's son. The kingdom suffered division and then harsh cap captivity by the powerful Assyrians and the Babylonians. The people of Israel discovered, as the Apostle Paul learned before his conversion, that it is hard for you to kick against the goats. Acts 26, verse 14. Now near the end of Solomon's life, you read of the beginnings or the impending trouble of or for Solomon and his kingdom. Yet with the completion of his earthly course of dying in Jerusalem during the 40th year of his reign, Bible history says nothing of his repentance, nor indeed any positive results of God's warnings or punishments as being seen in his life. His whole character probably became too worldly for the heartfelt penitence like his father David had underwent. In Ecclesiastes, Solomon recognized the fear of God, but his view appears to be more of a religious philosopher than a spiritual believer. In 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 9 to 13, we have God's final communication with Solomon. Look at verse 9 and 10. Now the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice and had commanded him concerning these things, that he should not go after other gods, but he did not observe what the Lord had commanded. God had told Solomon that he would be blessed if he obeyed God and that he would be cursed if he disobeyed. Now, since Solomon refused to obey God, the consequences were inevitable, as God always keeps his word. Look at verse 11. So the Lord said to Solomon, because you have done this, and have not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you. At the heart of God's covenant with Israel were the Ten Commandments. With these two, you shall not have no other gods before me. You shall not make yourself an idol. Silent had ignored that divine covenant. Therefore, the kingdom would be torn from him. God also said in verse uh, 11, uh, verse 1 of 1 Kings 11, the last part, I will give it to your servant. Now this refers to Jeroboam, who would be given the ten northern tribes to rule as their new king. However, the Lord said it would not happen in Solomon's lifetime. Rather, it would occur during his son Rehoboam's reign. Further, the entire kingdom would not be taken away. The son would still have one tribe. These consensus were made for the sake of your father David and for the sake of Jerusalem. Verse 12 and 13. You see, God was still expressing compassion, wasn't he? Now, what are the lessons for us to be learned in 1 Kings chapter 11? Certain actions have bad consequences, and we must live with that sad cost. This is one of the most important truths that we can teach our children. 
Parents who are always protecting their children from the penalties that they find themselves get into whatever trouble, who are always cleaning up their messes, are not teaching their children this lesson and can expect misery at the end of a not-so-smooth road. Now, we have surveyed the tragic final chapter of Solomon's life. Concerning the end of his father David's life, this is what the Apostle Paul said. David, after he had served the purpose of God in his generation, fell asleep. Acts 13, verse 36. Now, in regards to the end of Solomon's life, all it says is that Solomon slept with his fathers and was buried. 1 Kings 11, verse 43. In other words, Solomon, the wisest and the most foolish man, died and was buried with nothing stated about serving the purpose of God. A perplexing question for Bible students is this. Did Solomon ever repent? You know, we are given no indication in 1 Kings 11 that he did. But you know, I like to think that Ecclesiastes is his confession that he had been foolish and with his closing words expressing the sentiment from his heart. The conclusion when all has been heard is Fear God and keep his commandments because this applies to every person, even kings. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13. Yet he could only be giving this wise advice to others, but his hardened heart would not allow him to do the same. I know of two people from my youth that were members of the Lord's Church that I didn't know until after I became a Christian. But none of them were attending services or were faithful at all to God. But they would argue with anyone until they turned blue in the face that there is but one true New Testament church. Now tell me, people, what good is that if you're not living the example to go out there expounding that you believe there is only one true church? Now whether or not Solomon repented, the facts remain that Solomon's final chapter is packed with personal and national tragedy. Now that brings us to ourselves. I do not believe that Solomon woke up one morning and said, today I'm going to start worshiping idols. It happened, little by little, one thing leading to another over a period of time. For us, it occurs in the same fashion. A falling away through the spiritual erosion of a Christian soul, which is overrun with deadly weeds. A slowly breaking down of faithfulness rather than one a major event in our lives. It is time to ask the question, what about the final chapter of our life? Will it close on a happy note like he or she was faithful on the death and will receive a crown of righteousness? Or will it be a sorrowful chapter that ends with the words, he or she loved something more than God, and they died and were buried? At my age, I am keenly aware that I am writing the final chapter of my life. Now, I just hope it's a long, long, long one. But what about you? Regardless of your age, you could be writing the final chapter chapter 2. Death like God is no respecter of persons. If it turns out that you are currently writing your last page of your last chapter, how will it read? As said of David, let it be said of us, he or she had served the purpose of God. In the Sermon on the Mount was what's called the two foundations. Jesus taught that the wise man built his life upon a solid rock. 
that would withstand any obstacle from a deceptive devil. However, the foolish man constructed his life upon shifting sand that fell at the schemes of Satan. This morning, show your wisdom by building on the rock and giving God your life in obedience to the gospel and belief, repentance, and water immersion for the forgiveness of your sins. Turn to Jesus, who is greater than Solomon. Continue in faithful service to God, and you will prove yourself wiser than Solomon. As like Solomon began, some became a Christian in the past. You were wise. But now older, like Solomon, you left your first love and have become foolish. This morning, you need to repent and let us pray together about it. If you need to respond to his invitation, come right now as together we stand and as we stand.